Hello, everybody. Welcome to the online event of Tokyo Karaishi today. My name is Haneda Masashi, today's moderator, director of Tokyo Karaishi as well. And today we have another fascinating, excellent, distinguished guest speaker who is working in the field of science, technology, and society, Professor Svante Lindqvist, coming from Sweden. Uh, let me uh, introduce very briefly his uh, remarkable career. Uh, he is now a Ushioda Fellow of uh, Tokyo College and a great expert of history of science and technology. Uh, he, he, was, uh, a, he became a professor of history of technology at the Royal Institute of Technology in Stockholm in 1989. And just at the age of 44, he became a member of the Royal Swedish Academy of Engineering Science, Sciences. And then uh, two years after that, he became a member of the Royal Swedish Academy of Science. But astonishingly, uh, he became also a member of the Royal Swedish Academy of Letters, History, and Antiquities uh, in, in uh, 2002. It means that he is an expert of both science and uh, humanities. It's quite rare, and uh, uh, accordingly, he became uh, uh, the president of Royal Swedish Academy of Sciences uh, in 2009, and played its role uh, for three years. And he, also, he uh, played a, a great part uh, to establishing a, a very famous uh, museum, a Nobel Museum. He's, uh, uh, founding, he's the founding director of the uh, Nobel Museum, and he uh, has been uh, working uh, uh, continuously uh, for the Swedish Royal Court, uh, first at, uh, uh, as Marshal of the realm, and then now he's a Chancellor of the Royal Orders of Knighthood. And in Japan as well, he's an uh, uh, honorary uh, fellow of honorary member of uh, Japan Academy. Some of you uh, may know that he uh, gave a congratulatory remark at the entrance ceremony uh, to graduate schools last year. Unfortunately, it was online, but we uh, enjoyed very much his uh, warm words. And uh, uh, already he uh, gave us a lecture uh, once while he was at Komaba campus in uh, 2019. The title of that uh, lecture is The Gothic Cathedral of Science the Nobel Prize and the concept of revolution. Uh, you, can find, uh, uh, you can find the video uh, recording uh, on our uh, YouTube channel. Uh, it, is, it, it is certainly a very fascinating uh, lecture. And today he will give a talk uh, with the title, A Nobel uh, Laureate Against Nuclear Power, Hans Arfens, Hannes Arfen, Arfen and the Public Image of a 20th century scientist. Uh, we look forward to uh, his very uh, exciting uh, lecture. So uh, now uh, the floor is yours, Professor uh, Lindquist. Please start your lecture. Thank you very much, Professor Haneda. I'm honored to be invited back to Tokyo College and uh, also would like to express my thanks to Professor Okamoto, who makes my stay at uh, Komaba campus so pleasant uh, and um, I look forward to tell you a, a story which is very close to my heart. I've been working on it uh, for many many years uh, and it was the story now to see if I get the first slide no right the Nobel laureate against nuclear power Hannes Salvin and the public image of a 20th century scientist. And this is a book I've been working on for, well, to be honest, decades. And it's inspired by the French Annal School, which is perhaps seen as outdated today when new history has been new for decades. But I still think that this, this, what the Annal School suggests, how you should study time, how you should study how slow institu our institutions only slowly change is of relevance to the history of science and technology. 
this been my inspiration and I was detracted from working on this book uh, for two decades, first 10 years at the Nobel Museum and then 10 years at the Royal Court. And not, not much was written during these years, but one good thing with the pandemic from, from my point of view is that it gave me time to finish the manuscript finally. And it was finished only a month ago. So I'm, I'm relaxed and happy now and I'm grateful to have this chance to, to tell you briefly uh, about uh, what I have considered that I found out about Hannes Salvian and his role in, in Swedish society and in international history of science. The structure is a short introduction, which will focus on the Nobel Prize. Second, I will briefly tell you about the career of Alvian. Third, I will talk about public images of Alvian. And by images, I mean the physically images, the photos that were used by the media, the Swedish press, when they wrote articles on Alvian. And many, many articles were written on him because of his, he was very argumentative uh, when it came to uh, his views on science policy and especially his views on nuclear power, but more of that later. All this will lead to some reflections on science versus technology, where Alvian had some very specific views, which has some consequences for Swedish academic life. We'll come to that. At the end, concluding remarks, I will pose three questions. Uh, I will give my own answers to them, uh, or tentative answers. And um, I look forward to the commentators views on this, and also perhaps the audience would like to, to comment on my questions. There are questions, from at least the second and third questions can be discussed, and uh, my views, are, I'm, I'm willing to change my views on this. So I very much look forward to this. Now, as for the introduction, I will briefly just tell you something which is perhaps not need to be said to a Japanese audience because the Nobel Prize is very much well known in Japan and you have a long connection with, with the Nobel Prize ever since Albert Einstein received news about that he got the Nobel Prize when we, he was on his way to, to Japan and that started mm -hmm. sort of interest, a boom in interest for the Nobel Prize in Japan and also, as you know, when Yukawa got the prize after the Second World War, that was seen as a, a, a great sign uh, in, in Japan, that uh, Japan was back on track in, in, in the international community. So maybe this is needless to tell you, but I could remind you that the Nobel Prize is based on the will of Alfred Nobel, a 19th century industrialist. The whole Nobel system is just based on this very short will where he decides where his money should be given to these five prizes. Uh, and people are looking at the Nobel Prize to see it as, a, as an international value and that they should give prizes to concerns of today. There should be Nobel Prizes for the environment. There should be Nobel Prizes for this and Nobel Prizes for that. No, that that is not to be. They, this is a way, they, late uh, a will from the late nineteenth century, and the Nobel Foundation is just trying to follow what is written on these on these lines. And Alfred Nobel was a man of his time. You know, he was an engineer, but he definitely didn't institute a prize in engineering. No, he believed, as most people believed in those days, that engineering. Technology was just an application of basic science. So he instituted prizes in physics and chemistry. He had a great love for literature. So he instituted a prize for literature, but he had no interest in art or music. So there were no prizes for art and music, but he had a great belief in, in uh, the need for international peace. And he believed in the deterrence of weapons. So he saw his work in, in munition and weapon construction as a way to bring about peace. This is a bl rather blurry image from the first Nobel Prize ceremony in Stockholm in 1901. And in front of the podium, there's a man receiving the first prize. It's 
Conrad Röntgen who received the first prize in physics and he receives it from the crown prince because the king didn't think that this new prize was worth his uh, concern at all uh, and uh, it was not much uh, appreciated at the time because it was an international prize and that was seen as unpatriotic uh, and uh, here you see a hall filled with people uh, on the on the ground floor are all the members of the academies, but on the balconies, people are all dressed up. But these are not, these are the servants employed by the members of the academy who have been told to dress up and line up so it would give the impression that this was an important prize. But it very soon became seen as an important prize by the international community and also by, by His Majesty the King. And during the period 2001 and 2021, a total of 975 prizes have been awarded. And then I include the 89 prizes that was instituted, the prize that was instituted in 1968 for in, in economic sciences. But uh, we in Sweden are very much uh, concerned with making the point that it's not a real Nobel Prize. Uh, nobody cares about that abroad. Uh, they are called Nobel laureates, nevertheless, and, and receive the same amount of attention and international prestige. The bank, uh, the prize award ceremony is, is a grand Swedish affair, and I stress Swedish. It's not so much appreciated or talked about or broadcast abroad. And you can see that there are Swedish flags. Now, lately, they added a Norwegian flag on top because to make the point that the Norwegians give out the Nobel Prize for peace. And on the front stage, you can also see the royalties sitting, uh, His Majesty, the Queen, uh, and uh, other members of the family. But during the last 10, 20 years, the family has grown. So there were not enough gilded chairs and not enough space on the stage. Uh, so now it's been reduced. So the King and Queen, the Crown Princess, and her husband are the four persons on, on the stage nowadays. And when the king hands over the prize to the Nobel laureate, uh, he has in reality nothing to do with it. Uh, he's just been invited by the Nobel foundations to hand out the prize, but he has no, no part in the evaluation or decision process. The Swedish government who's sitting on the front rows uh, in the concert hall, all believe, or most of them believe that this is a Swedish state prize, but it's, the Nobel Foundation is a private institution. The government are there as their guests. The king and his family are there as their guests. And the king's task here is just to hand out the prizes. And as a thank you for this, the Nobel Foundation invite him and his wife and family members to this grand banquet in the city hall. A grand affair, which is much appreciated by a Swedish audience, but not, not seen, talked about abroad, because it's really became an international prize, even if we see it as a Swedish prize. But my, the point I want to make here is, is that, uh, and that's, you are aware of here in Japan, that the Nobel Prize carries a lot of prestige. A Nobel laureate can express his or her views on almost anything and be believed. Uh, but it became, fairly soon an international prize. This is a, this map shows the prizes awarded in physics during the first decade of the 20th century. And you can see they were all given to Europeans. That changed. So now look at the physics prize in the 1960s. Now there has been a change. There are prizes given to scientists in the Soviet Union prizes given to scientists in Japan, and prizes given to scientists in the United States. And uh, many of these laureates in the late 20th century in the United States were Europeans who'd fled the Nazi Germany and settled in, in the United States. But it, it became and is seen today as a truly an international prize. And that's because of the international system of nominations. Uh, scientists all over the world 
are asked each year to nominate scientists. And then these nominations are carefully evaluated. Uh, this diagram, hard to read, I'm sorry for that. The point here is that uh, the peak in the middle is the amount of money that the Nobel Prize carries. And there are, there are a number of other prizes that have been instituted since then, uh, like the Japan Prize, the, uh, the Balkan Prize, the Kyoto Prize, uh, but the MacArthur Prizes. But the point here is that it's not a question about money because no other prize can match the Nobel in terms of prestige because the Nobel Prizes have been handed out since 1901. And on the list of Nobel laureates are such giants as Albert Einstein, Marie Curie, and others. And no new prize, no matter how much money it carries, can ever match the track record of the Nobel Prize. Now, so the point I made here is just that if you get the Nobel Prize, it carries a lot of prestige. And that has some, some importance for the story I'm going to tell you. And now it'll be a lot of Swedish details here, but I want to outline the career of Hannes Salvian, a Swedish physicist born in 1908. He received a PhD in physics at Uppsala University, the oldest university in Sweden, situated 70 kilometers north of Stockholm. And this was, uh, he, he received the, uh, uh, the PhD at a fairly early age. He was very talented both in theoretical physics and in experimental physics. Uh, in 1940, he applied for and received the chair as Professor of Electromagnetic Theory and Electrical Measurements at the KTH, the Royal Institute of Technology. And there he developed a department uh, which quickly grew because it focused on electronics, which was a big thing after the Second World War. And the name of his professorship was changed in 1945 to Professor of Electronics and in 1963 to professor of plasma physics. He resigned in 1973 and stayed on as professor emeritus. But earlier in 1967, he was appointed a visiting professor at University of California in San Diego. Uh, more on that later. Sorry for the blurry quality of this photo taken by my mobile, but KTH, the Kungliga Tekniska Högskola, the Royal Institute of Technology, its motto is Wetenskap och Konst, science and art, is the translation usually used, which is quite wrong, historically speaking. What it really means when it was in 19th century terms, theory and practice theory and practice it has nothing to do with art as we, we know it. And it's a beautiful campus here from 1917. Now it's spreading all over uh, way back, many, many new buildings. And here is the context where Alvian worked. And this was an engineering school. And like most engineering schools, like um, MIT, TIT here in, in Japan, there were, these technical schools were founded uh, during the Industrial Revolution to train workers in the industries and give them basic knowledge in physics, chemistry, and mathematics. And they were very close to the Industrial Revolution in all these countries. So, for example, in England, they were founded in Manchester, Birmingham, London, not in Oxford or Cambridge. Uh, likewise, in Sweden, these technical schools were founded in Stockholm, in Gothenburg, but not in Uppsala or Lund, which had uh, traditional universities. So when Alvian received this position, he came to an engineering environment. He became very much a part of the engineering culture, and he had to, in a way, adapt to the values uh, uh, the value system 
of the engineering community and of Swedish industry. This came to influence his work in, in, in many ways and also directed his research to a large extent. But he continued with his main interest, which was cosmical physics. Here he's shown, this is a typical media image of Albion. They asked him to take off his coat and fiddle a bit with the apparatus uh, just for the photographer. Uh, the big uh, tank you can see to the left is, is an experiment to uh, recreate Aurora Borealis polar light, which was one of the things he studied. He had worked out a theory for that already in 1939. In 1947, he became a member of both the Royal Swedish Academy of Engineering Sciences and the Royal Swedish Academy of Sciences. Uh, and he, he became very much well known and respected in Sweden as a both in engineering because of his inventions and or for his theoretical discoveries. That was in Sweden, but not abroad. I know in the time when you speak of global history, this is perhaps unfashionable, but it's, it's worth it to remind you that science is not a, a, a universal knowledge shared by everyone everywhere. There are strong national differences. And we can say there was a Scandinavian school for aurora research, geocosmical physics. And there was a British school for uh, geocosmical physics of which Sidney Chapman was the leader. And uh, since about 1918, 1920, and he was the grand old mine of geophysics. And he disapproved of Albion's theories. He thought they were downright wrong. Uh, not uh, correct mathematically. He was a very rigorous mathematician. Uh, he thought that Alvena was impulsive, intuitive, uh, had made shortcuts and was basically wrong. And uh, the fight between Alvena and Chapman became well known in uh, international physics uh, among astronomers and astrophysicists. And this fight, or it wasn't a fight, there was a difference in opinions. Chapman never wanted to discuss openly with Alvian, but he and his colleagues wrote nasty reviews of Alvian's publications and books. Uh, and, um, but they never met in open debate. And this went on from 1940, 1950, 1960, until Alvian received the prize in 1970. So for 30 years, Alvian was very much adopted uh, by the international community of science, whereas in Sweden, he was seen as a great scientist and a scientific hero since the early 1940s. So these differences between national and the international science uh, have, have fascinated me. Uh, I think it's, it's interesting to, to point out uh, science is not a universal knowledge shared by everyone. In 1967, as I mentioned briefly, Alvian got a, a position at, as a visiting professor at the University of California in San Diego. Why and what were the consequences? Well, the University in California in San Diego was a new university. They tried to recruit the best they could from the United States and, and Europe. Alvian was a well-known scientist, so he was of interest to them. But um, when Alvian received the, the invitation, uh, he, it came at a very good moment because in the early, early 60s, he'd started to argue against Swedish nuclear policy. He'd been very much in favor of nuclear power ever since 1945 and, and, and uh, was a member of the committee to, to institute nuclear power in Sweden. But, uh, in, but he didn't believe in the, in the technology that they chosen, uh, what's the so-called Swedish line that we should use heavy water and natural low-grade uranium from Swedish mines to make us totally independent. Because A, he thought that this technology was uncertain and risky, 
and also a byproduct of this technology was plutonium that could be used for nuclear power and nuclear uh, weapons. And this was indeed the idea also by, by Swedish authorities, because at, at that time in the late 40s and 1950s, Swedish had a plan to, to build our own nuclear, uh, nuclear weapons. But uh, Alvin dared to criticize uh, the Swedish plans for a nuclear power plant according to this technology. And uh, that, and he threatened to leave Sweden. And this is just one of many articles uh, discussing those uh, hundreds of articles on this. Uh, it says here in Sweden, Hannes Alvin threatens to leave. And um, he, he meant that his uh, the critique he had posed had meant re resulted in a reduction of his research grants. And he said that during, under these circumstances, I cannot pursue my search for science. I will move either to United States or the Soviet Union. I have offers from both places. He was a good demagogue, great in rhetoric and uh, in those days, in the 1960s, uh, I think worldwide, there was a fear for brain drain, that our talents, we would lose our talents. And it was seen as a moral vir virtue to, to, to leave just because the main thing for him was the search for truth. Uh, we, or at least I and many of my colleagues, believe, uh, do not believe in this. Uh, we see science as much more embedded in society. But in Sweden at the time, this was seen as a, um, a, as I said, a moral virtue. But he was, he got reaction from, from Swedish industry. Mr. Alvin gets his response, the head of atomic power in a counterattack. Uh, quotation, it's literary, Fantasy by Alvin, uh, but he's not, not close to reality. So here they, on this front page of the main Swedish daily, you see Alvin to the right and the executive director of the Swedish nuclear power industry to the left. So these are just two examples of many, many articles on this. But Alvin left and, and went to United States. And so there was a brain drain and everyone in Sweden thought this, it was very sad that we lost Alvin, but in reality, he, it just meant that he spent the six months each year in La Jolla in Southern California. Not a bad thing. We know that who experienced the Swedish winters, but uh, joking aside, it had, uh, for his science, it was good because it meant that he every year came in direct contact with United, scientists in the United States and could feed back uh, discoveries and discussions from United, uh, from United States. Uh, and back home at his department at KTH, the Royal Institute of Technology, work progressed as before. No change really. It's only that Alvin uh, was away six months each year, and then he came back. But he had another unexpected consequence. When he came to United States, he came in contact with the emerging peace movement and the bulletin of atomic scientists and union of concerned scientists. He'd already been involved in the Pugwash movement and uh, he arranged the first Pugwash movement. And the Pugwash movement was an international informal uh, society in a way, organization rather uh, by international scientists against nuclear weapons. And Alvin uh, was very much against nuclear weapons and he became very much involved in the Pugwash movement. But Alvin, he coined the phrase Siamese twins. He considered nuclear power and nuclear weapons as Siamese twins. You can't, if you have nuclear power, a byproduct will be nuclear weapons. So therefore you must abolish nuclear power. And uh, he tried to 
he tried to make the Pugwash organization to take this point of view, but the majority of the scientists involved in Pugwash were not against nuclear power, but they were against nuclear weapons. So Alvin resigned as president of the Pugwash movement in 1975. But his, his move to the United States had an interesting consequence in the sense that he came back each year with new arguments from the peace movements and fed them, injected them into the Swedish debate. And therefore the debate on nuclear power in Sweden became very heated. And uh, each year Alvin added new arguments and he got responses and there were articles and articles on this. And when he left, this is a, a cartoon in one of the Swedish daily newspapers. Here is uh, Alvin to the right is seen as leaving together with a colleague, Professor Ehrensvärd, and they are seen as leaving you know, Sweden because it's a country in decay led, led by conservatives destroying the country. You can see the, the suitcases are packed and it says two United States and some ties are hanging out of the suitcases. A typical cartoon at the time. Uh, but in the case of Professor Ehrensvärd, he had retired from his professorship and just got invited to spend a year, a sabbatical year at the Rockefeller Institute. It was not a, a, he didn't leave Sweden in protest. And as I said, Alvin and the Swedish media portrayed Alvin's departure from Sweden as a, as a great loss, but uh, it, it was in reality no, no real loss. Uh, but it had this interesting consequence that it fed new arguments into the Swedish debate on, on nuclear power. In 1970, Alvin received the Nobel Prize for Physics. Why and what were the consequences? Well, why he received it then is basically the development of rocket technology since the 1920s, 30s, and especially during Second World War, and uh, development of space technology, uh, satellites since the light, late 1950s, and spacecrafts since about the same time. I think this is an image to the right of Mariner 5, one of many early satellites and spacecrafts that confirmed Alvin's theories about the importance of electromagnetic forces in space. So the theories that Chapman and others, the British school has criticized, uh, Alvin won this debate by having experimental confirm confirmation by measurements in space. This diagram shows the nominations of Alvin for the Nobel Prize in Physics from 1953 to 1970 when he received the prize. And this is true, you can make these sorts of diagrams for every Nobel laureate, it's very easy. You can now go in for, look at uh, the website, uh, nobelprize.org uh, and see uh, the nomination archive. So you can make similar uh, diagrams for, for Yukawa or other Japanese laureates. Here it just shows that Alvin received a handful, a few nominations each year uh, uh, up to the early 1960s. But then his early theories started to be confirmed in the mid 1960s and the number of nominations from abroad increased. Um, you should not look at the difference between six and five or seven or eight. You can just see that it increased during the 1960 as a result of the uh, space exploration. The Nobel Committee for Physics are studying uh, and are, are always studying about 10 or 20 different fields of physics. And each year they especially study, say, four or five interesting fields. And one of these fields now in the 1960s became astrophysics. So they thought, and the most prominent person here in astrophysics in the late 1960s was Hannes Alvin. But on the other hand, he was a Swede 
He was a member of the Royal Swedish Academy of Sciences. It was sort of sensitive to give one of our own the prize. So then the Nobel Committee did, the Nobel Committee for Physics did something very unusual. They asked a, a British scientist, Professor Thomas Cowling, to make an evaluation on Alvin. Cowling was a former pupil and loyal ally to Sidney Chapman. Uh, so his evaluation of Alvian, no surprise, was very negative. And usually these evaluations are 10, 20 pages. Uh, in Cowling's case, he, he wrote a rather short letter to the Committee for Physics and said that although he appreciated Alvian in many ways, he, he thought many of his theories were basically wrong. And he said he finally uh, finished saying that he didn't believe that Alvian was worthy of the Nobel Prize. So the Nobel committees were very surprised by, by this short, short letter and didn't really know how to handle it. Uh, so they gave the prize that year and the following year to other fields of physics, nuclear physics or solid state physics or whatever it was. But uh, they asked for other evaluations and they were finally able to, to find that Cowling's arguments were basically wrong. Alvian was correct and he was a worthy recipient of the Nobel Prize. And then in 1970, he received the Nobel Prize. Uh, this is from the prize ceremony in the Stockholm Concert Hall. And this changed Alvian's status, not internationally, because uh, internationally he'd been seen as a great scientist ever since his basic theories had been confirmed in the early 60s. But in Sweden, he was seen as a, as a hero, someone who's been resurrected. Uh, and his position as a Nobel laureate gave him a platform to speak from. Uh, he could always call the media when he came home from the United States and they would come rushing to him. And he, he, he gave many interviews and he was believed as many Nobel laureates are. Mind you, I'm not saying that uh, Alvian misused his position as, as a Nobel laureate. He didn't speak on issues on which he was not trained or knowledgeable, which has happened to other Nobel laureates. He spoke about the things he knew about. He spoke about physics and astrophysics, uh, and, uh, but his position has changed. Uh, you can see him arguing in, a, in a, at, the Academy of, at the Academy of Sciences. So now we come to the public images of Alvian. I already mentioned the articles, that there were many articles. This is a diagram I made with some difficulty. I've collected over the years all articles I could find in Swedish newspapers on Alvian from early from the 1930s until his death in 1995. And it's, it's about 1,500 articles. And if you put them on the timeline like this, you get an image of the life of a scientist. The first little mentioning of him is when he gets his PhD. And then a few weeps in 1940 when he applies for and receives the professorship in Sweden. And then his, his research in astrophysics in laboratory, reconstructing polar light and other things, early fusion research receives a large attention by the press. So, so there are many articles about him in, in, in the 1950s and, and early 60s. But then you see, when you take a stand against nuclear power and leave Sweden, that's the highest peak. That's the most articles. And the next peak is 1970. That's when he receives the Nobel Prize. And then he enters into a political debate in Sweden and takes a stand in party politics and brings about the turn of a government, actually. So the Social Democrats have been in power since the early, since 1920s, 1930s. They had to leave for a conservative center government in 1976. So Alvia, this was over the question of nuclear power. 
and um, Alvin played a key role in, in that change of government. And then you can see the interest in Alvin gradually uh, slipped away, but um, some nuclear accidents abroad made the debate in Sweden on nuclear power heat up again. But finally, the, the interest in Alvin and his, his opinions faded away. And, uh, and you see a final peak in 1995, that's all the obituaries that he received in Swedish media. So this is the life of a scientist in, in, in the form of a diagram. Now, I've been fascinated by the various images that the newspapers choose when they wrote all these articles of Albion, because they had to choose from a number of photos that changed over time as Albion got older, but they could also choose images depending on um, what, what angle they had in the article. This photo of a young Alvian uh, was used in the 1930s and 1940s. Uh, then in the 1950s, the newspapers started to use this image uh, of Alvian. This was used from 1950 to the early 1960s. And you can see he's, he's wearing a beret, which was a traditional headwear for an artist or an intellectual. Uh, and uh, a thick overcoat suitable for Swedish winters. So this was the image uh, much used. But then when he got the prize, this is an image of a proper scientist. And this is the official photo at the Nobel Foundation website. If you look at the nobelprize.org's website, you'll see this, this image of Alvian. Uh, but um, that was not how the Swedish general public saw him, because he was very much active in uh, the public debate on nuclear power and future nuclear power, making his point about Siamese twins, the danger of nuclear power, because it would lead to, to, to nuclear weapons. And that was his main concern. But he realized that in order to reach the general public, he stressed the environmental difficulties with, uh, with uh, nuclear power, how to take care of radioactivity, radioactive waste from nuclear power plants, the security problem of nuclear power plants. And uh, he played on, on the growing feeling uh, and worries for the environment in, in the 1960s. So these were the images that the Swedish general public saw. That's another typical image of Alvin. Uh, here is out speaking against the plans to mine Swedish natural uranium, and uh, which he succeeded with. Now, his uh, former department and his former university, the Royal Institute of Technology, they were very unhappy with this image of Alvin especially since he was their first and so far only Nobel laureate. Uh, and they wanted to portray him as a pure scientist, uh, not engaged very much in, in, in social activities. And uh, so this is what the uh, department and the Royal Institute of Technology claimed to be the official image of Alvin. And here you see a, a peaceful, friendly, man almost smiling at you, well-dressed, and uh, nothing of a, uh, the demagogue, if I back one pick, nothing like this. They wanted to seem like this. Now, but most people saw him, they had seen this image so many times, or this image. So this how, was how he was seen. Then in 1989, just before, uh, the real computer revolution, Sweden decided to produce a natural encyclopedia, 20 volumes of all knowledge, a, a major project that involved hundreds and thousands of writers to, to, combat, to, to, uh, to write all these articles in the new encyclopedia. And in the first volume, A to B, Alvin should have an article, and his department 
So this was their chance to correct the public image of Alvin. So they did a lot of work. All his former colleagues at the department wrote an article, all his major contributions in science and not by a sentence mentioning his arguments for years against nuclear power and nuclear weapons. It was just a, a few words at the end of the article showing that he, Alvin also had showed some social concern, but nothing in detail. And by that, they thought that they had now finally corrected the image for posterity of Alvin. But no, 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 no. They had not counted with the independent editors of the Natural Encyclopedia, the people who chose the photos that was to go and illustrate their articles. They had, these were young editors and they had grown up. They'd seen the images of Alvin as an agitator for decades. And for them, it was natural to show an image like this instead. And this is the one that exists in the Swedish Encyclopedia, volume one, published in 1989. And here you see Alvin walking around, strolling around in rather baggy chinos and a shrinkly shirt and no tie. And his hair looks like Einstein. And he's walking in a field of dandelions. <laughs> and the dandelion was a symbol, still is a symbol for the Swedish Green Party, of which Alvin was a member since it was formed and until his death. Uh, uh, so this was when the volume of the Swedish Encyclopedia, Natural Encyclopedia was published, this was, it was a great disappointment for his colleagues in his former department for, and for everyone at the Royal Institute of Technology because this was not the image of Alvin that they wanted to go down to posterity. Now, as for science and technology, in 1980, Alvin resigned from the Academy of Engineering, but he remained a member of the Academy of Sciences. Why? Well, he, the Academy of Engineering Sciences consists mainly of engineers and industrialists. The Academy of Sciences consists mainly of scientists and a few engineers and industrialists. There is an overlap between the two academies. Alvin was a member of both, but that's not so common. But he, he asked the Academy of Engineering Sciences to make a firm stand against nuclear power. And they refused. And he had entered into a heated argument with the president of the academy. And, and in 1980, when Sweden had a referendum on the future of nuclear power, Alvin resigned from the academy and asked them to what, wipe away his name from the directory, which they did. But he remained a member of the Academy of Sciences. Why? Well, he tried to ask the same thing from the Academy of Sciences, that they also should take a stand against nuclear power. But here the sciences were divided. And they didn't want to enter into something that was party politics. Their main concern was to keep the prestige of the Nobel Prize intact. And therefore, they could not enter into a Swedish political issue. So, so they, like, they refused to, to make this stand. And Alvin, very much upset, he did not resign from this academy. Why not? Well, my theory, opinion is that had he resigned from the Academy of Sciences, he would also have, in a way, resigned from his own Nobel Prize because that had been given by that academy to him. Um, that's, uh, that's my own interpretation. My concluding remarks, and I've spoken, I can see, for 50 minutes, so I'll be very brief. Uh, three questions to discuss. Are Alvian's views on science versus technology relevant today? I mean, he saw science as a search for pure truth. He was willing to leave Sweden to be able to pursue this search, should it come to that. And, uh, but technology he saw as contaminated in a way by, by the hunger for profit. And he saw many engineers as being uh, working for the arms industry, nuclear weapons industry. 
and whereas scientists were pure. In that question, on that question, the answer is easy. His views on science as pure uh, versus technology is not of relevance today. Historians and sociologists of science have, since the 1930s, and especially since Thomas Kuhn's famous The Structure of Scientific Revolutions and the group of social studies of science, social constructivism, etc., shown beyond any doubt that science is very much embedded in, in, in society and it, it's not a pure ivory tower that Alvin and his contemporary believed in. The other two questions are more difficult. Are Alvin's views on the dangers of nuclear power relevant today? Well, if you'd asked me five, 10 years ago, I would say they were not sort of relevant, but now, uh, Nowadays, uh, the energy crisis due to the war in Ukraine and in Europe has made us in Sweden start to discuss and, and take decisions that we would now start up old reactors, we will be new, build new nuclear power plants. And we, we believe that we can take care of the nuclear waste by uh, putting it in copper cylinders, fill them with concrete and dig them down in the ground 1,200 meters under the Earth's surface. Some experts say that this will not work. The copper cylinders will deteriorate within two, 300 years. So what will happen then? Uh, but the Swedish ground, the granite, the rocks are very solid. We have new, we have no earthquakes like you have here in Japan. But um, the problem is, how do you tell future generations 100,000 years from now that there is dangerous stuff in the ground? What language should you address them in? And in what ways should you communicate with these, our future uh, fellow humans? Uh, but myself, I have my basic training in engineering. I believe that we can overcome the dangers of nuclear power by advancing technology that we can handle security, we can handle nuclear waste. Uh, but uh, I'm open to various opinions on this. Alvin's views on the threat of a nuclear war relevant today. If you'd asked me three years ago when I was here last time, I would have said no. There was no risk threat for a nuclear war three years ago. But now, only six months or a year, the threat of a nuclear war is very much discussed in Sweden. And we have quickly turned around and applied for membership of NATO. Uh, and uh, the, the idea that we should, could risk a nuclear war in the Baltic Sea or even uh, nuclear attacks in Sweden is discussed today as, as, a, as a relevant question, which is a totally, total difference from anything. And that has certainly changed since I was here three years ago. So I leave you with the last image of the old Alvén taken just before he died in 1995. And with this, I thank you for your attention. And I hand over this to my colleague here, please. Well, thank you very much, Professor Lindquist, for your very interesting story about uh, our physicists uh, in Sweden, about the life of uh, physicists in Sweden. Uh, today, uh, we, we got a lot of questions uh, already uh, through internet, and you have the right to write us uh, both in English or in Japanese. And uh, so far as the time remains, I will uh, transmit some of them to uh, Professor Lindquist later. But before that, uh, we have a special uh, commentator today uh, to the uh, talk uh, of, uh, taught by uh, Professor Lindquist. Uh, I'd like to introduce uh, Professor Fujigaki Yuko. Uh, she's a professor at a school of, at the School of uh, uh, Arts and Sciences uh, in 
at the University of Tokyo, and she is now working uh, as an executive vice president of the whole university. So she she is a very high profile person at the university nowadays, and her specialty is uh, science, technology, and society. So uh, her field is uh, very close to Professor uh, Lindqvist's one. So uh, let's listen to comments by Professor Fujigaki, please. Okay, thank you, Professor Haneda. Can I have a, my slide? Yes, thank you so much, uh, Professor Lin Quist, um, for your very interesting lecture. Um, I'm Yuko Fujigaki, a Vice President of University of Tokyo, and I'm doing research on sociology of sciences. So um, I was so uh, I was uh, your lecture was so interesting for me, and um, I will show my comments to your presentation. Please. As you know, as we know, a message from Nobel laureate have some influence to society. Public tends uh, tend to listen to talk by no Nobel laureates. For example, uh, this is a picture of Nobel prize dialogue held in Japan last October. It is on water, or water matters, and six Nobel laureates attended this event. This dialogue was conducted by Japanese Society of Promotion of Science in Japan and Nobel Prize Outreach AB in Sweden. Um, the theme of Nobel Prize dialogue in 2018 was future of food and those in 90, uh, no, 2019 was aging society. Mm. So uh, when I heard the topic of uh, uh, Professor Linda Quist's presentation, there comes two questions in my mind. The first question is, are there any Japanese Nobel laureates who had activities against nuclear power? And the second question is, why do activities by Japanese Nobel laureates against nuclear power affect the peace movement, but not to anti-movement to nuclear power plants? So these are my questions. For the first question, are there any Japanese Nobel laureates who had activities against nuclear power? The answer is yes. This slide shows the Nobel Prize winner in physics, in 1949, Professor Hideki Yukawa on his research and prediction on, of Mason. He's the first Nobel Prize winner in Japan. He also attended the Pugwash Conference held in 1957. The first Pugwash Conference in Canada held just two years after the public announcement of the Russell Einstein Manifesto. This manifest uh, stated that nuclear weapons threaten the continued existence of mankind and that uh, there is a strong need to govern them. 22 scientists from 10 countries gathered in Pagwash and discussed about three themes. First, danger of nuclear energy in war and in peace. Second, international governance of nuclear energy. Third, responsibility of scientists and international collaboration. Nobel Prize winner Hideki Yukawa and Shinichiro Tomonaga attended this conference. Shinichiro Tomonaga is a Nobel Prize winner in physics in 1965 on his research on renormalization theory. He also attended Pagwash conference with Hideki Yukawa. Several times, Professor Tomonaga cited the statement of Robert, Robert Oppenheimer, who was engaged in the development of atomic bombs in US. Oppenheimer's statement in 1947 is, in some sort of crude sense, which is no vulgarity, no humor, no overstatement over can quit extinguish. The physicists have known sin, and this is a knowledge which they cannot lose. Tomonaga said that Oppenheimer's uh, physicist sin is considered to have ration 
with the concept of original sin in Christianity. He expressed that research in natural science itself have a potential to affect human being negatively and that this kind of sin lurks in physical science. During the Cold War, Pagwash Conference had taken pragmatic, pragmatic line and adopted logic of nuclear deterrence, which means only the comparative level of nuclear weapons of both sides can stop wars. On the contrary, Nobel uh, laureates, physicists Yukawa and Tomonaga acted up to nuclear abolition. They established scientists Kyoto Conference where scientists discussed about the world peace in 1962 with Shoichi Sakata. They criticized the inconsistency of nuclear deterrence theory and declared Yukawa Tomonaga manifest in 1975. It is pointed out that there was a sense of original sin of physicists at the base of these behaviors. So Nobel laureates, physicists Yukawa and Tomonaga acted to lobby for the international elites with their scientific authority. Okay, so let us move on to the second question. Why do activities by Japanese Nobel laureate against nuclear power affect to peace movement, but not to anti-movement to nuclear uh, of nuclear power plants? As you know, on March 11, 2011, the very big earthquake and tsunami attacked East Japan and more than 20,000 people died. Uh, this is a uh, this is a picture of tsunami at the uh, the ships uh, means that the, it is a result of tsunami, and the right side this is a picture of fire in Kamaishi area. One days after the earthquake, the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power plants had hydrogen explosion because of the loss of electric power supply of cooling system or nuclear fuel rod. Uh, this is a, a picture of hydrogen explosion of Fukushima nuclear power plants of reactor one and reactor three. So after the accident, I received lots of questions from foreign researchers. Uh, there were three questions. Number one, how are nuclear power plants embedded in political, economic, and social context in Japan? Number two, under what kind of relationships between science, technology, and society are such accidents produced? And number three, how the relationships among science and technology and society are constructed historically? These are very, uh, very, very difficult questions to answer. To answer these questions, so we have published a book by Springer, Lessons from Fukushima, uh, Japanese case studies on science, technology, and society. Okay, so the answer to the second question, second question, why do activities by Japanese novel laureate against a nuclear power affect to peace movement, but not to anti-movement of nuclear power plants? Uh, the answer to this second question is written in the chapter two of this book. Okay, this is the last slide. The culture acceptance of nuclear uh, energy in Japan can be divided into three phases. In phase one, from 1945 to 1969, some physicists played an important role in garnering culture acceptance of nuclear energy. As you know, atomic power has two phases. The the light phase, that is atmosphere peace, and shadow phase, uh, that is atmosphere bombs. A physicist, Mitsuo Taketani, insisted that Japan is the only country that ever experienced nuclear devastation. Therefore, the Japanese deserve a strong statement on nuclear power. The Japanese have a greater right to do research on atmosphere peace than other countries. He insisted that the depth of the shadow from which the Japanese suffered from nuclear gave the Japanese a right as well as a duty to use light side of nuclear power. The three principles such as autonomy, 
openness and democratic control were included in the basic law of nuclear powers in 1955. Raising these three principles, physicists persuaded the public of the need of nuclear power, despite the public's anxiety regarding the negative side of nuclear power. Thus, Japanese physicists play a role to establish nuclear power plants in Japanese society. This is the answer to the question, the second question, why do activities by Japanese Nobel laureate against nuclear power affect to peace movement, but not to anti-movement of nuclear power plants? Activities against nuclear power by Japanese laureates, such as Professor Yukawa and Professor Tomonaga, affect to peace movement like Japanese scientists meeting in Kyoto. But these activities did not affect to anti-movement of nuclear power plants since other physicists in Japan played a key role to establish nuclear power plants in Japanese society. Okay, this is the end of my comments. Thank you for your attention. Okay. Well, thank you very much, uh, Professor Fujigaki, for your excellent comments. Uh, so far as I understand, uh, Professor Lindquist uh, uh, posed three questions and uh, asked uh, no, uh, and answered this question by himself. And uh, Professor Fujikaki also uh, asked, uh, ha had two questions and answered uh, by herself. And so in this respect, they, they, they had their uh, own questions and uh, proposed answers to these questions by themselves. But maybe uh, it's, it's good at first to start uh, uh, discussion session uh, to comments to other uh, at first uh, Professor Lindquist you uh, make some comments uh, to uh, Professor Fujikaki's comments and then <laughs> after that maybe uh, Professor Fujikaki once again uh, uh, respond to uh, Professor Lindquist's question or remarks mm. like that uh, let's start the discussion okay Thank you very much, Professor Hamira. Uh, thank you, Professor Fujikake, for your interesting comments. This was, of course, new to me, this uh, uh, stand against nuclear power by, by Yukawa and his, some of his colleagues. And I think Alvin would have agreed with them to, to large, totally. And uh, I was also fascinated by your quote from, from Oppenheimer. Uh, Alvin believed this, uh, strongly, he said something similar that this the scientists who had developed this new force of energy and, mm -hmm. and a weapon, they had had a responsibility, they had committed a sin. They must now work to to abolish it because they were responsible for creating it. Uh, Professor Aneda asked us to 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 answer reply to our suggestions for answers, but. I think the point here made by both uh, Professor Fujigaki and myself is that there's a difference between questions, problems, and answers uh, in the sense that we as sociologists and historians in the humanities, we, we believe that there's a difference between questions and issues. Uh, engineers believe that all problems can be formulated as a question and that all questions have a solution and the solution is technological solutions the means for which they are trained whereas we believe that not all questions have a solution have an answer we believe that many questions are issues and they have no direct answers they can just be discussed as we are discussing them now so please, Professor Nira, don't ask us to specify our replies anymore. We have just raised <laughs> issues that we both think need to be discussed now and by everyone okay. forever. Thank you. Yeah. So uh, uh, do you agree, uh, Professor Fujiwaki, yes, with, yes. <laughs> with his point? Okay. <laughs> right. So uh, two uh, eminent researchers have already submitted their uh, position uh, or their opinions today. Uh, 
relevant to uh, the nuclear weapon or nuclear policy. And so uh, we have uh, many questions already. Uh, some of them are in Japanese and many of them are in English. And uh, so I will pick up some of them and ask mainly to Professor, uh, transfer these questions to Professor Lindquist. And <laughs> please, this time, please answer these questions because they are just a question to, to your uh, lecture. We'll see. Uh, at first, so I will read uh, a rather long uh, question. Uh, Our vans moved to the United States in protest against Sweden's nuclear stance must surely seem ironic at time when the United States was arguably leading the proliferation of nuclear weapons during the Cold War. Did Afghan engage with these geopolitical considerations? How did his involvement in the Green Party influence? Uh, how did his invol involvement in the Green Party influence his views on the nuclear issue? And did not his political advocacy and affiliations complicate his uh, purist view of science as a pursuit of truth independent from society? Hmm. A good question. I have no direct, you asked for a direct answer to that, Professor Anil. I'm afraid I can't do that. Uh, um, his position remained the same. He did not live to experience Fukushima, but he saw other uh, nuclear disasters. And uh, um, I, But I don't think uh, his involvement changed his view on pure science. No. No. Mm -hmm. Okay. So the next question is that, uh, yes, uh, you said that uh, the science is not universal. Mm -hmm. and, this, and the next question is relevant to this. Uh, it seems that uh, cultures also differ in what kind of explanation method uh, feels logical. Although it is said that science is not universal, the current international academic evaluation evaluates Western logic. So how can diversity be maintained? How can, sorry, how can? Diversity, diversity be maintained. That's a very good question too, yes. Uh, um, my personal view is that I hope that diversity can be, be maintained. Uh, and uh, uh, it's a sad thought if everything is judged according to one set of norms. Uh, history shows us that uh, these norms change and what we believe in, in to be scientifically true changes. And, and uh, um, if you have a, a system of peer reviews, which I think that Alvin much objected to, uh, real original thoughts, uh, and new ideas will be suppressed. So, so uh, I'm all in favor of, of diversity and, and uh, so the, the strive for consensus and peer reviews is, is, is a danger for, for, for changes of, uh, of our knowledge. Mm. And, and do we have any other, uh, any other comments, Professor uh, Fujigaki, on this issue? Because uh, uh, since we are a university located in non uh, Western world. Uh... Ah, yes, it's a, a very, very a difficult and interesting uh, question to mm -hmm. answer. The science is not universal, but <laughs> citation is always very. The number of citations are always very important to evaluate some. Uh, the, the achievement, research achievement. So mm. the evaluation system of Japan is based on the uh, our belief that science is universal. So I think that if uh, we do not admit this beliefs that science is universal, then the evaluation system should be changed. <laughs> Uh, but in the area 
of uh, humanities, the paper written in Japanese is much, in, much more important than the uh, paper written in English. But the evaluation system by the natural science uh, stress that the English paper is much more important than mm, the because they are universal. Yeah, yes, that's the very very important but difficult question. Mm. Yeah, we are struggling always from from this question. Yeah, mm. uh, at the University of Tokyo, we discuss we have discussed continuously the importance of writing in Japanese, especially in humanities and social sciences, some, some part of social sciences. But at the same time. Uh, we are always facing uh, the criticism from the public or the government that the the, the ranking of the university ranking is not enough. Uh, we need to uh, promote more about uh, promote more the, the the writing in English and the, uh, more influential. We encourage uh, researchers to write more influential uh, articles. Uh, with great impact, <laughs> but it's it's quite difficult to 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 solve these questions to to these uh, crises, to, to face against these uh, to, to say something against these criticism. But uh, uh, this is not a place for or this kind of discussion. And let's continue uh, to ask questions to uh, Professor Lindquist. Uh, Next one is written in Japanese, uh, but I will try to introduce uh, 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 to, to translate it in, into English. Uh, is uh, the view Arven Arven uh, my pronunciation is good Arven Ar Arven's uh, view uh, to what extent uh, to what extent influence the uh, nuclear policy of the current uh, European countries. His views, yeah, his views. Well, his views have no no influence on the European mm. development. It was just a, a national development in the nineteen seventies, and that's uh, that's many decades has passed since then. So, mm -hmm. but no, no, this was a, a national affair. So he 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 has already been uh, forgotten by many. Yeah, uh, absolutely. Yes, oh. yes, yes, and. Uh, the fact that I've now written a book on him that will be published is is uh, uh, make me sort of relevant uh, nervous because I I want to be relevant for historians like you, Professor Haneda, yeah. with my interest in the Anal School and so forth and historiographical points of views. But but it now it turns out that these issues that uh, Alvian raised, uh, the Siamese twins between nuclear power and nuclear weapons, and the threat of a nuclear war are highly, they are on the front line every day in the newspapers. So I think my, my book will, people will look at the book to, to, to search answers for the questions of today, but the, that's not what I attempt to give. I just, mm -hmm. I'm a historian, I just describes how the views were in the 1960s and mm -hmm. 70s. And, and by implication, uh, it shows the, the diversity and how ideas and structures change, but uh, history does not provide any answers. Mm -hmm. uh, from history, as has been said, that from history, we only learn that people doesn't learn anything from history. That's, uh, a joke, but it's uh, some truth in it. Uh, okay. Uh, the next question uh, is uh, uh, on the photography, uh, photographs mm. of, of Arvan. In Japan, two photographs are uh, used to promote STEM, mm. science, technology, and medicine, especially women's participation in STEM. Uh, use people experimental tools and atmosphere that can be felt to be scientific. Mm -hmm. What do you think about these things? <laughs> well, I, I think um, the photographer, many of the images I show are arranged. The photographer had asked 
for example, the image I showed, they asked Alvin to take off his jacket and fiddle with his instruments. Mm -hmm. uh, they, they create an atmosphere which is their belief of what science is and scientific work is. But it, it's also an image of what they think that the audience would like to see of, of scientists and scientific mm -hmm. work. So it's a, it's, a, it's a double effect here, both the photographer and the photographer's attempt to, to, to satisfy the public with, with preconceived ideas. Mm -hmm. So it's a, it's a complicated, fascinating process that the results in this choice of images has very little to do with reality. And when you line up people and ask them to pretend they are investigating or testing, uh, experimenting, all this is fake, but uh, that's what the photographer and his editor wants to have, and they get it. The scientists cooperate in, in appearing before the cameras in, in, in a stupid way. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, the time is now uh, running out. Uh, we have just uh, five minutes left. Uh, so. Uh, for me, uh, I, I have a question to you. Uh, not not a question, but uh, uh, maybe maybe it's it's a question. Uh, <laughs> uh, according to you, so uh, even science uh, has some kind of bias, or uh, not bias, maybe uh, uh, some some logic uh, of the age. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, that is the same thing, of course, uh, in historical studies or in philosophy, etc. Many other disciplines as well, especially humanities and social sciences field. We uh, are always discussing this issue, mm. and uh, this is uh, the first time that I I, I realized that uh, even uh, uh, science has its own uh, moment. Mm. Uh, so it's quite interesting uh, in this respect. And my question, so uh, my question is that uh, in this uh, in this context, uh, the university itself is has as its own uh, moment or has its own uh, reason mm. uh, to be to to be to to exist. Mm. And uh, when the university was the modern type of university was established in the end of the nineteenth uh, century or at the beginning of the twentieth century. They had their own uh, uh, reason, of course, to be among the society, to be in the society, and the university itself is embedded certainly in the society. In this respect, uh, what is the future of our institution? Uh, according to you, uh, science is not universal. Each country or each nation has its own science, more or less, yes. and uh, uh, humanities also, mm -hmm. uh, social science also. In that respect, what would be the international uh, collaboration or uh, the meaning of the university in each country? Oh. Yeah, that is my uh, question. To you. Well, your question is perhaps an issue too, okay. if you don't mind. But uh, no, I, I'm not that strong in my opinion. I don't claim that there are totally natural differences. In, in this case, I showed that there are natural differences uh, in this specific case. But uh, all these, uh, you can view scientific knowledge as islands, different islands. Mm -hmm. And then they combine and, and finally agree on a, a general point of view, which is transformed by universities to next generations that mm -hmm. we we had, we argue and we make experiments and hypotheses and then a, a, a commonly accepted body of knowledge is uh, finally established of course mm -hmm. and that is uh, for the universities to to convey this common knowledge this yeah, to no. next I mean, in, that, yeah. in that case in which language we shall we have a, a common knowledge in which language yeah <sighs> Hmm. Well, since the Second World War, it's English. It's English. Yes. Uh, <laughs> my father grew up and he learned German. Mm. And everyone in Sweden learned German until the Battle of Stalingrad, and then we changed into English. 
So who knows? Maybe in the future, the common language will be Chinese. You know? <laughs> so, I don't know. But uh, let me just finish by telling you an anecdote. I, yeah. I gave a talk once to the Academy of Sciences about views on the polar light in the 18th century and how they looked upon physics, uh, what they believed at, that electricity was. Uh, and uh, from their point of view knowledge, all this makes perfect sense. Uh, it could be argued that, yes, we thought it sounded very strange, but the way they looked upon the world, uh, it was logical and uh, based upon experiments. And after my talk, uh, a friend of mine, he, he was secretary of the Nobel Prize Committee for Physics at the time, I've been to engineering school together, and he came up to me laughing and said, oh, thank you for a wonderful lecture, Santa. It was great to hear how stupid they were in the past, and what strange things they believed. It was hilarious. Thank you so much. <laughs> I enjoyed it very much. And I thought to myself, oh boy, I wish you lived for another 300 years. Uh, to see what people then will believe about your scientific yeah. articles yeah. today. Mm -hmm. But I didn't say that. I'm too polite. Yeah. <laughs> thank you very much. Uh, speaking about being polite, I would like to thank you, Professor Haneda, yeah. for this talk. And thank Professor Budigaki for your interesting comments and informing me about Japanese scientists. Uh, very fruitful experience for me. I appreciate that very much. So thank you both so much. Well, thank you very much, Professor Lindquist and Professor Fujigaki, for your excellent talk and discussion. And uh, we hope, I hope uh, that we will have another opportunity uh, to discuss uh, problems or questions about science. Issues. 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 <laughs> issues. <laughs> issues uh, related to science, technology, and society uh, in the future. Uh, so thank you very much for your participation and see you soon next time. Thank you.